hosted by Mike the Big Cheese. <laughs> Welcome to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. It is Sunday, March 5th. We're ready to the third month of the year and my first official full week of being retired. It just actually feels like I've been on vacation for a week. It hasn't kicked in yet, but I'm sure it will next week when I don't have to report for duty. All right, like I said, right there, Attacker with Disciple of the Battle at Helm's Deep record. One of my top 10 favorite albums of all time. And the first guest that we had on the show 15 years ago was Michael Sabatini of Attack and the band had just gotten back together. They had a new singer. I think his name was Walter Figueroa. Uh, a very young kid. I don't think he was born when Attack actually was out playing in the beginning of their career. Uh, but he wasn't bad. It just wasn't a very good fit also. And uh, he wasn't in the band long after that. And Bobby Leatherlung's Lucas took over not long after that. So there you go. We got a great show for everybody tonight. Bernie Carlos from Sai is on. He's our first guest up tonight at 6.30. And Frank Oresti from Demon X and Fate's Warning. Heaven and Hell Records, a good friend of the show, has re-released that demo and that unreleased first record. They did an amazing job on it and the packaging like they always do. Uh, I just haven't heard back from Frank to confirm tonight, so I'm hoping that he realizes that he's on and remembers. We'll find out in about an hour or so. 
All right, we're going to keep the music flowing between now and then. The last couple of weeks, we've been busy with back-to-back guests, and they've all been live, and tonight's no different. But now that I don't have to rush to get to work on a Sunday night after the show is over, we'll keep it going a little longer to get more music on. I know we've been lacking music the last few weeks, but we'll get more on it. We'll get to our demolition segment, maybe in between the two guests tonight. But how about we do some boss? I'm going to reach out to the singer for this band. I've been a big fan of this for a long time. Try to get him on the show. We'll probably have to pre-record because he's still in Australia. And the time difference is just too big. A, you know, it's just too great. I think it's like 14, 15 hours to New York. But enough chit-chat. Here's boss. Hard and heavy. <laughs>
All right, Bashful Alley with the Rescue Me. And right before that, Titan, the Watcher, coming off the Rough Justice record from 1985. They were so great. I haven't had Kevin on the show. Kevin Riddles is the main guy in that band. I haven't had him on in years. I have to reach out for him. Lately, he's been doing uh, Kevin Riddles' Bath for Me. They're out there doing a lot of the early Angel Witch stuff. He says he's kind of got the blessing of Kevin to do it, which kind of doesn't make sense to me because Angel Witch is technically still active, even though they don't do much. They do put out some new music. They do play live here and there. Uh, so we got competing bands. That seems to be the theme with everything that goes on in the world today. And we'll talk about that in our rant after the first interview is over. It's, it seems to be the same one every week, just focusing on different bands, but we'll get to that a little later. Right now, we'll do our demolition segment. Uh, we'll do two songs tonight, one by Invaders and next by Rigor Mortis. But this is the Rigor Mortis from Germany. Uh, not a lot of people remember these guys, even know them, or have the demo, so we'll play something off of that. Invaders were a pretty cool band out of California. Uh, they had two demo tapes out in, I think, 84, I want to say they both came out. The band was around since 81, 82. And I know a few of the guys in that band went on to play with Kerry Dahl in the later version of the Kerry Dahl band, which became just Dahl, if that makes sense to a lot of people. But, And I think, actually, the, the, the singer and the bass player played in Witch for a little while. Uh, it was probably like a fill-in in the 90s. But this was a great demo tape. And after that, like I said, we'll follow it up with Rigor Mortis. But here's Six Feet Under.
All right. I know what? I didn't upload the rigor mortis, so I'm going to have to do that right now. So you can have to bear with me a second, and then we will get back to that. But I really like the Invaders. You know what? It's funny. If you listen to that, it actually has a little bit of that doll sound in it from Kerry Doll. I usually play them on my hair metal show, but for some reason I forgot this year. Don't ask me why. <laughs> it was just busy. That's what happens on your pre record shows. I don't like the pre recorded but all the holidays this year fell on the weekend, so I kind of had to. So just give me a second here, and I am going to upload... That song by Rigor Mortis. All right, here we go. Okay, this is Rigor Mortis. We'll do uh, Metal Hardware. So enjoy. <laughs> go metal hardware off their one and only demo tape from 1985 the final assault metal hardware by the german rigor mortis the open riff of that song sounds a lot like motley crew wild side i guess motley crew are fans of the band back in the day all right let's get on a song by side i'm gonna get bernie on the line right after this uh let's do do or die
some great stuff. Let's get Bernie on the line. We've been batting a thousand the last month, connecting with everybody. Hopefully tonight I'll keep that streak going. Hello? Bernie, this is Mike calling for our interview. You're live on the air. How are you? Hey, Mike. Doing great. How about you? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, man. It's such a pleasure to talk to you considering that I remember getting that first demo tape back in 1982 and being such a fan. And that have you on here, I'm thrilled. Oh. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, that's how far back I go with you guys. And, man, what a, to me, two of my favorite records, Return on the Fly and Wings of Change. I always w- wish, like, so much more came out of the band back in the day. But, you know, for people that weren't familiar with the group back then, let's kind of maybe go back to the beginning, how it all started. Oh, okay. So, it's, it's, it's the early 80s, you know. How did this all come about for you? Well, we've been playing, like, I mean, early 70s. You know, um, just um, playing music here in uh, Canada, in uh, the Toronto area, and uh, traveling all over the place, playing little bars here and there, uh, the entire country actually. And um, I guess in uh, by the early '80s, we decided to just write some songs and uh, play originals. That's about what happened. Wow. So this really goes back to the 70s. I didn't think it went that far back. Well, that's when I started playing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, no. I've been playing since uh, the mid-70s as far as um, professionally anyway. My first band, I was 17 years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's Um, fantastic. played, Played lots of music. Where are you guys from? The show is based out of New York City. Oh, okay. With a yeah, little, with a little tiny place on the East Coast. You sure? <laughs> I've listened, like I was saying, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember yeah, getting that. Yeah. Fir- I remember getting the first demo in '82 and being such a fan and thinking, "What a shredder you are! And what an amazing guitar player!" You know, listening to you play and. You know, a couple of years later, you know, the, the, back then there was no internet. There were very few magazines out, so people weren't able to really keep track of bands. If, you know, I being a tape trade, having pen pals back then, that's how we kind of learned about bands from different places. But when Turn on the Fire comes out in 1985, I mean, the band signed to Metal Blade Records, which was a really, you know, well-known up-and-coming label at the time. How did you come to get a deal with Metal Blade? Oh, okay. Yeah, my friend uh, Wayne Archibald. Um somewhere in northern Quebec. We were uh, touring uh, northern Quebec, and we ended up playing in this little place, um, uh, a little region in Quebec there for about a year and a half. And uh, what what a place. They all like heavy metal and all that stuff. And uh, this is like in the early 80s. And uh, so we kept in touch. And um, upon coming home and then recording that, uh, that album, I sent it to Wayne. So Wayne actually knew uh, Brian Slagle. So that, that's how it came about uh, from uh, that gig from uh, Quebec. Wow, very Little nice. place in Quebec, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Canada is such a big place, you know, and like Quebec, one of the most major cities there, a French Canadian city, by the way, for people that don't know. Bernie, do the French Canadians think they're better than the regular Canadians because they can speak two languages? Uh, well, I guess the French are a little bit better speaking English, <laughs> right? Because the English, the English, they don't really know much about the French. But it, yeah, that's that's about what happened there. Yeah. But um, but what a place, um, the Quebec area. That uh, these guys are rockers. They they understand. Like I mean, they like the partying and all that stuff. And they're not so uptight, just like uh, the way it was here in um, where we are in Toronto. You know, because yeah. it's a different society altogether. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's Toronto, like, another major it, it, city too. I mean, was how, how was it easy to make make your way through the towns back then and play? Being such a big place and having to do it by word of mouth. Uh well, we used to travel in our van and just play everywhere. And in those days, it was a little bit easier because you actually got booking agents that book you in these little places, right? Yeah. And it seems like live music was so much more. Uh, appreciated then 
It's true. You know? It's true. Yeah. 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 It's crazy because I say that too. I said we have the internet now. And, you know, it's so easy to, like, put your music up there and get it heard and get it out there. But I actually think it was easier, more fun, and better in the 80s. I think so, too. Because the internet, that's just it. It's always available. You don't really long for it. That's right. It's there. (laughs) You know, like, you don't even need to keep CDs. It's in the cloud. Yeah. The problem with that is uh, it's in the cloud. You, You don't have it. So you, you, you're not really compelled to play it. I don't know. It's just one of those things. You learn that, a song for, uh, you know, when you, when you look at YouTube, instead of figuring it out and you pick it up from uh, somebody showing you on the internet, it doesn't stay with you. you you're know? right. It, rather than when you, when you have to fight for it and really learn the lick. Yeah. You know? That was the best explanation of listening to music on the internet I've ever heard. That kind of sums it up all the way. You don't own it. It doesn't belong to you, and yeah. you don't appreciate it. That's amazing. That's really what it is. That, that's what it is. Like I like to sit in the middle of my room, uh, in my music room, and uh, look around and look at my movies, my CDs, and which one I'm going to play today, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and when I sit there and I look at the uh, album covers and all that stuff, that's said, hey, okay, I want to listen to this. But when you got it in the cloud, you know it's there. But you, if you, unless you open it or you do something with it, it remains there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, you know, Bernie, all those years of with the band in the early days, from the early 80s to the first record comes out, you know, Turn on the Fire in 85. They were demo tapes of a lot of live shows. I mean, you kind of built up the name of the band. You got recognized. You know, you, you put the act together. Now the album comes out of Metal Blade. And what were you expecting from that? I mean, did you hope for more? Did you think Metal Blade was going to back you up more, support you more? Because it seems like they didn't really do that kind of job for you guys. Well, you know... It's really up to the band as well. We, we really should have just dropped everything in uh, in the mid '80s and just just leave, just go. Yeah. But, uh, the guys in the band they're not as adventurous as I was. Um, like I really didn't care. Said so let's just go. We have this record deal. Um, you know, like I don't know where it's going to take us, but why not? And at the time, it was like the explosion of uh, Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses and all that stuff. So, I don't know. I just couldn't convince the guys just to drop everything and leave. It's you hard. Know? Yeah, I, that's I a hard thing. I, I came. I, you know, like, they didn't want to go, so I flew down to California first time. And uh, I met the people in um, Metal Blade. And I seen California for the first time, and <laughs> I think it was like, summer of 1984 yeah and uh you know i checked out the uh, the club scene and it's so much different out there like you got 5,000 people in the bar like i mean that's unheard where we came from you know like 500 people is a lot a lot of people where we came from and when you go out there you got this 5,000 uh capacity for a bar then uh that that's just it we should have just went you know yeah <laughs> Yeah, but you know, you had the idea, you had the vision, you, and you knew what had to be done, and the other guys really weren't on board with that, but when you get into a band, that's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's one thing when you form a band, because just, you know, you, a bunch of guys in the neighborhood that want to get together and have fun and play on the weekends, but when you get into a band, especially in the 80s, when metal was like taking over the world, and it was as big as it was by 1985, you kind of have to know, hey, I, I got to go all in, I got to get in that van, and I have to drive cross country, I have to drive all over the place, I, yeah. you know, I have to, yeah. you know, it's a struggle, you know, not having a, a a full-time job or a paycheck and but you have to be willing to do that to take that chance because if you don't what chance do you really have of uh-huh. making it yeah and plus yeah i mean uh why not right i mean you got to do something with this life you know yep. uh you got to do it. yeah that and i really and i really thought you know like i mean you know like you got a chance take it because you don't want to you know you don't want to look back and go well maybe i should have done something yeah so I did, I did. I, I came out there and see if I could do it. But it, you need the band. You need the band behind me. But I was the only one there, you know. But I kept writing, you know. And True. I didn't really. Uh, I kept trying too, until about uh, the late late eighties or early nineties. By this time, I was all you know, like thirty, thirty one years old. And, uh, I need to get a job and support the family <laughs> at that time, you know. Yeah. 
is, my, is being in a band a young man's my... game? Is being in a band a young man's game? You really got to try to do it when you're young and you don't have those commitments? Well, okay, yes, maybe it is, right? But I think it's um, it, the love of music, right? Like, I mean, nowadays you don't even need to really do anything. I mean, if you love playing, right, and, you know, you can write, you can play, uh, I think that's it because it never leaves you. Like, I, I still play to this day, you know, and sometimes more or less, but uh, I still play. That, that's great to know. Yeah. And there was a reunion some years back too, wasn't there? Yeah, we played a uh, we, we played a show after uh, thirty years. I haven't seen the guys, and uh, we 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 did the show, and it was uh, it was amazing. It's like we never left. <laughs> yeah, it, it was so tight. You know, for, I guess you know the, the uh, two hours a day for uh, five years. Uh, really, you know, it was really pronounced when we started playing again. It took a little while to to jam, but it was all there. Yeah, and that's the amazing part about playing with good musicians. Yeah, I, you look absolutely. at each other and you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, who, who was so, part of that reunion that was lineup? Day. Was it the Turn on the Fire lineup or the Wings of Change lineup? It was the Turn on the Fire lineup. The Turn on the Fire lineup is actually a better lineup than um, than the Wings of Change lineup. Um, better players, I mean, you know. Yeah. Um, when we started doing Wings, Wings of Change, I, I, I'm not saying anything wrong about, with the, the other guys. They're really good players too. But uh, something a little bit more with the first album. You know, because by the time we got into uh, doing the second album, it's um, it's a lot faster. Yeah. And um, it, it didn't have the texture of the first album. But then again, People always tell me that the second one is better, so I don't know. That, I was going to say like. that, but that's what a lot of people say. That they like the second, Winds of Change, Wings of Change better. Yeah. And I'm like, to me, it's, yeah. it, it's the same band. You know, your guitar playing is very distinctive and, and the vocals. But it was. It was, a, it was a faster record, more of what was going on, I think, in the late 80s than like in 84, 85. Definitely a change. But, you know, both records are, are stand out on their own to me. Like, you know, Turn on the Fire was the first album I, I got by you guys. So to me, that's the side that I know. But Wings of Change, I thought it was a great record. Yeah, no. Uh, that's, it got really aggressive. Like if you, if you uh, hear the second album from the first. But then again, Shoot to Kill. It's uh, the direction where it's going, you know, by the time, uh, you know, we, we finished th that first album with the double bass and the, the fast uh, tempo. So by the time we got the second album, uh, yeah, you know, um, it was a lot faster, you know. Um, and I guess it's, it's the players, too. There's some things that I really would like to do there, but um, th the players were different. You know, and yeah, uh, yeah. different feel, but I, it's still good. I still like it. Oh, I, I love it. But I mean, when you when you were working on that record musically, were you just in a different place musically that you went that direction, or did you feel that you know the scene is starting to change? This is what's happening right now. This is how we got to write a record to be relevant to what's happening in the late '80s and to what's coming. Or was it just musically that's where you were at that point in time? Yeah, musically, it was just going there. You know, like we weren't after any style or anything like that. Um, that's just the natural progression from the first album to uh, going to the second one. Yeah, with the Wings of Change, where the, the instrumental is, uh, um, it's, I guess it's a lot more adventurous, you know. But then the changes on the, on the first album, I mean, whoever plays in a 5-4 tempo, nobody does that. But that's turned on the fire. It's a five-four tempo with double bass, and I don't even know. Like, I mean, how that happened? <laughs> when people ask me about the uh, the tempo, I said I I don't even know what they're talking about. But when I, when, <laughs> and then I I started to count it. And, yeah, you're right. It is a five-four tempo, and I don't know. <laughs> you weren't even I, sure. I don't know any songs. <laughs> no, <laughs> I just did it. Yeah, but no isn't wonder, that the way yeah, writing? No wonder that yeah, I think so. I think so. But yeah. that's the way you. That's and, way. That's the best music when you write without realizing or thinking about what you're writing. It just comes out of you naturally that way. 
he right and then the guys in the band are pretty competent uh, they you know we argue like shit right but oh <laughs> sorry i didn't you, need to yeah. that's okay it's on the internet um, you could curse <laughs> okay sorry about that yeah and uh you, you know we would argue about some things and then at the end of it like i said wow this is really different because when you listen to those changes um yeah there it's it's not ordinary and I, we didn't know that. I mean, I didn't know that until when I looked back and listened to it like 20, 25 years later. I said, wow, how did I do that? <laughs> or, you know, like when I start, you know, when you start writing, when I start writing things now, and now that I'm a, a more mature writer, I, I could never write anything like that because everything is, uh, is almost calculated now. It's got to be this, this, and that. Not the way when, you know, we were young kids. And uh, just playing, yeah. That's true. Well, you know, after after turning the fire comes out, like it says, you know, you you kind of like split up with the other two guys in the band. Went on so over those three or four years, you know, there were a lot of changes taking place in the music scene and within the band itself. But when the other two guys left the band, or or you left them, whichever way it went down, I mean, how long was it before you found the next lineup for Wings of Change? And you know, did you kind of click right there? Was it something that had to be worked on? No, uh, it took a long time for uh, Wings of Change to make um, because when um, I couldn't convince the guys to go to California um, to, you know, to give it a really good go, I knew that was the end of uh, the first group um, because if you're not going to go and you already have an album, what are you going to do when you put out the second album? Yeah. Uh, you're still going to do the same, right? So I had to make a decision at that time. Maybe, um, I don't know if it's the right one, but... Um, I, I needed to pursue it a little bit further, but it took it took about two years to find the people to, that will play it, and then another two years to uh, play the songs as, uh, as far as rehearsing it, and then finally going into the studio to record it, and finally finish it in around '89. So it took it took a little while. Yeah, absolutely. It took a little while to do. Uh, yeah. And that and that record came out on I think Loud Spell was the label that that record came out on. So you kind of split up with Metal Blade after that. And you know yeah. how much longer did the band go on after the Wings of Change record came out? Because I don't remember hearing much of the band after that. No, that was it. That was the um, that was it as far as um, making records. Uh, we didn't do any more after that. Like that. That's then I became a real estate agent after that. <laughs> Right up, right up the alley of music. <laughs> yeah, but but I still love it. I still love music. Yeah, you know, like uh, it it gives me a big kick. Like when I listen to to, to your station nowadays, right? Like I mean, when I turn it on. Oh, you're the guy. I hear the, 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 the yeah, and I hear the stuff that you guys are playing. I'm going, wow! I remember that. Yeah. You know, it kind of puts a smile on my face. Well, yeah. I'm glad for that, but you know, you know, Bernie Canada, yeah. such a great music scene when you think about it. Big place, so bands from all over. But there's something about Canada and, and a three-piece band, Anvil, Triumph, yeah, you know, <laughs> Rush. I mean, is it is it mandatory to be a three-piece band to come out of Canada? Oh no, no, no! It's just easier with only three people. Yeah, it's it's just easier. Yeah, right? that it is. <laughs> Yeah, Anvil is actually, they were a four-piece band. In the beginning, yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. Lips yeah. wanted more money, so he cut the other guy out. <laughs> I don't know about that, but... Yeah, I knew those guys, you know. We used to play the same places. Yeah. I don't know. I guess um, being a three-piece, uh, it, just, it just happened. Yeah, and there's always talk about, well, maybe it's better with another guitar. You know, but it just seems so much easier when there's just three of us. I come yeah. in with the song, and next thing you know, we're just gabbing it, and that's it. No, it's that's done. that's true. That's very true. I think the only people that say it's better with a second guitar player are the bass players. They're the only ones that say that, is that they'd rather have a second yeah. guitar player in there. But you really have to be good at your instrument. You really have to be up on your chops when you're in a three-piece band because everybody's got to pull their weight no. and contribute. You better learn how to sing and play guitar at the same time. Yeah, that's true. Was that easy for you? Oh, no. That that was really hard. Um, but what are you going to do? You got to do it. So what I, what I used to do is uh, I would practice 
uh, and get one thing down cold that, that, that I don't have to think about it, like the, the vocals or the guitar, right? And then play along with the record. And that's the only way I could do it. Wow. And then if you do it enough times, then when you play with the band, oh, yeah, it just kind of makes sense. But, yeah, it took a long time to be able to do that because you, you got to think there, there's two parts that you're playing, you're much like a drummer, right? Yeah. Absolutely. What I mean, did you always plan on being the singer in the band, or was there ever a point in time where oh. you looked, actually looked for a singer to, you know, and just, maybe it just didn't work out? Oh, well, we were always looking for a singer, but couldn't find any, couldn't find one. But then again, it's, it's, it's all about having the confidence to sing, you see? I wish I knew what I know now, then. We all do. Singing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah it, 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 ain't that the truth? Like, if uh, people would only have confidence in themselves, right? Because singing is so, uh, so out there, right? That you got to be really, really secure. And, and lots of people, I mean, they'd rather criticize you than give you a compliment. So it, it's hard. It's hard to put yourself out there. But, if you can and have the confidence to do it, then uh, I think you'd have a better time, you know? So oh, that's man. what I tell people. Yeah. Yeah. It makes if you, sense. If you want to, yeah, if you want to sing, just do it. Everybody's special, you know, like uh, you're the only one with that voice. So it may not be Ronnie James Dio, but Ronnie James doesn't sound like you or Neil Young, right? That's right. Doesn't but... sound like Ronnie. That, and Ronnie true. don't sound like Neil, so so everyone's special, right? Yeah. And you don't you don't ever have to compete with anybody, just have fun and yeah. That that if sums it all up. Then I uh, yeah I would have had more fun, you know. But, but you could but sing. That's that, the yeah. whole thing. I mean, you're an amazing guitar player, but you're a really good singer too. You could actually sing. Well, you see, that's just a matter of how you feel within you, right? Like I didn't know I could do that until much, much later uh, when I was, when I gained the confidence. Yeah, like I knew I could do it, but uh, let's just look for a singer anyway. That was our attitude. And, yeah. yeah. But once you put that first I, record out and you're the singer, is it hard to now go and look for another singer because you sort of defined yourself as the voice of the band and that's what people kind of relate to. Yeah. yeah. I, we could just never find anybody that could sing with us. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, all right. See, I didn't know how hard those songs were because I was always been singing it. But w when I look back, like nowadays, right, w when I try to sing them, you got to be on top of your game to be able to sing songs like uh, like that because it's the pitch is really high, right? Yeah. And if you don't, if you're not, in, if you're not in shape, you can't just go out and, and do those screams. No way. <laughs> it's hard. So I didn't right? realize it was. Yeah, I didn't realize that until later. That wow, that that wasn't too bad. Yeah. No, it wasn't bad at all. But when you did the reunion yeah. show, like you said, it, it sort of came back like getting back on a bike again for the first time. But vocally, how was it for you? Because a lot easier to pick up on the guitar where you left off, and if you've been playing over the years, but singing, you know, people's voices change over the decades. Oh well, you see, I kept myself in shape. Right, and I told you about the confidence stuff. Yeah, I'm more confident now than I ever was. So when I sing those songs, I do it with a lot more conviction, and um, I didn't lose my range because I, I practice. I practice my range. I'm a, I'm a technically better now than I was in 1985 when I didn't really know anything or I didn't have the confidence. So now I do, and I and I feel comfortable with. What I sound like. I don't have to compete with anyone. I'm just me. Yeah. True. And yeah. there's a lot of videos up on YouTube of that show so people can catch them and watch them and see, you know, hey, this guy still has it. I mean, after that show, I mean, it was always planned as just like a one off thing, or did you guys, after that, say, hey, maybe we should, you know, start doing this again? Well, that's just it. Uh, we were going to do some things again, uh, you know, two years ago, and you know what happened. Yeah. 2020. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, kind of put a tie back on things. But uh, no, we still talk to each other. You know, we still get a big kick out of playing. So, um, yeah. 
Just uh, Gunner, is he's my brother-in-law. You know the the bass player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For uh, the first the first album, he's actually my brother-in-law, right? So we're family. Um, so I see him, and uh, and Steve, you know the drummer. Um, we talk to each other. So and it's it's a joy playing with these guys, Mike. It really is. I didn't appreciate him uh, as much as I do now. Then I mean I knew they were good, right? But when you haven't played with uh, good people for a while, and then you hear them in the same room, and you're just and you're just playing simple shit, right? But it's good. Yeah, absolutely. You know, five years ago, you know, Cult Metal Classics, a great label. You know, I guess reached out to you and they re-released both of those records. And you know, from the time the band broke up, I would tell like the reunion show, which all kind of took place, you know, around the same time frame. Did you think people forgot about the band and who you guys were and what you were about from those two records, or did you realize that there was this cult following of people that still kept up with what you guys did and were playing that music? And now there's a whole new generation of young kids that probably weren't even born when the band was out that are listening to this music now. Wow, you know, Mike. I'm always so surprised and um, and glad, right, that people actually cared about some of the, the music that we were playing. I really didn't think anybody cared, you know? And then uh, when the internet came out, like I would see it once in a while, and I would see, you know, people talking about it, and I'm going, well, that's good. You know, yeah. and, and that's, that's my main thing, why I wanted to make records is... I wanted something to remember the, the stuff that I used to do. And that's the only, that, that was my biggest reason for becoming a musician. Um, yeah, to make records. And, and at least I got, I got to do that. I guess that's forever. Once you lay it down and now, now you have a copy, you know? So I'm really, really glad and to, um, to find out that there's actually people out there that enjoy um, what we used to do. I'm really appreciative of that. You should be, because people really appreciate good music, and that's what you gave us, two great records that 30-something years later, people still talk about, still play, and interesting. We you know Cult Metal Classic did a great job releasing that, and those records were gone. They came out in a limited quantity, and they were sold out, and they were gone. So that says something about the legacy of the band and what you left behind for people. Wow. I am so grateful for that. Yes, Mike. That's why when you called... And you said, you want to talk about this? Uh, let's do it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was really happy to hear from you. Yeah. And I'm thrilled because I'm such a big fan from going back to, you know, when the band was basically formed. And what I loved about the, the, the re-releases of Cult Mother Class is that they took a lot of those songs that were from those early demo tapes that people never got to hear. If they, you know, you want a tape trader back in the day, like Coffee, Tea, and Me, all of those great songs wound up found in the way onto, as bonus tracks on these new records. So I was thrilled about that because oh, yeah. my cassettes are wearing out. So you don't really get to hear them that well anymore. Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. I got early eighties, Coffee to your me, yeah, for sure. Fantasy. Yeah. Um songs like that, like fantasy to this day, if that was recorded properly, it would it would still I think it would still hold water because the way it was. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was it's, a great um, tape. Weekend it, it's tonight, uh Strings March I think was on there. So many killer songs on that demo tape. Yeah. Yeah, listen, listen to that song. It's the night and weekend. The changes. Yeah, like I, I, I don't really, I didn't really appreciate it that much. Well, you know, but when I listen to it, the movement in those songs, right? It's not a straight ahead one, two, three, four. Like when you listen to the breaks, like how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> It's like you said, you were in the moment back then and you, you weren't thinking about it. you were writing. You were just writing how you feel. And when you try to get technical yeah. about it, you're like, wow, how the hell did I put that together? Yeah, no, it, it's very true. And, you know, in those days, I mean, we were just starting to play. I mean, we're competent players, but we weren't we weren't as good as we were like we, late later on in the decade. But the feel, you know, like when I listen to, to the songs, I'm going, this is, this is actually good. There's a lot of movement in it. 
Yeah. It's true. Like you said, you know, you were playing since the mid-70s as, as a teenager. And, you know, being, yeah. learning how to play an instrument and playing it well is one thing, but being a songwriter is another. I mean, when did you realize Ooh. that you could write music, too? Was it something that just came natural to you at, from, throughout your playing, or was it something that you really had to work on to kind of master the art of it? Well, when I couldn't figure anything out that I can hear, that's when I said, I've got to make my own song. <laughs> I would sit there and listen to a Richie Blackmore, like uh, uh, smoke on the water, right? And I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. I, I can't do it. You know, at first, right? So I said, oh, okay. I have, there's only one thing left to do now. I better make up my own. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. Crazy. But I, well, later on, I got a little bit better, uh, you know, listening to the songs and figuring it out. But of course, it takes a long time to be able to figure out a lick, and that's what I'm talking about. Uh, and when you uh, learn it, like, I mean, note for note, when you have to pick it up from a cassette or, 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 or um, a record, it would stay with you. Uh, the songs that I figured out then, the guitar solos for uh, Zeppelin, Since I've Been Loving You, I could still play it today. And that was 50 years ago. Yeah. Because it took me two years to get it. <laughs> you know? Amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, you, yeah, you talk, I, yeah. being a songwriter, you know, I mean, as a guitar player, I should say, you know, and like you said, learning how to come up with riffs and write songs and compose them together, is it more difficult as a guitar player coming up with a different and a unique solo for every single song, or is it the songwriting part of it that was more challenging to you, the chorus riff part? Oh, the rhythm section had a lot to do with the solo. Yeah. Um, Gunner, and, Gunner and Steve, oh yeah. You, you'd come in with a simple riff, right? And then you do it. You know, you got your verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and then bang, you go to the solo and they're doing this rhythm, right? And they're pushing you. They're pushing you somewhere like, wow, this is, this is amazing. You know, I think it's the people that, uh, you know, uh, they drove me to play that, to play those solos. You know, and, um, and that's why it was good that we had that chemistry yeah, because when you listen to the songs, um, it seems like the background, uh, the chords that I'm playing the solos over are different than when I'm singing. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, that's got a lot to do with the bass playing and the drummer because I would come into rehearsal and they, they've already worked out their parts. You know, so by the time I play my, uh, my rhythm and here comes the solo, they're doing this thing, you know, and I'm going, wow, this is really, really good. Yeah. And they all are. When you're working on a solo, I mean, is it really like, nope? I know you said it comes out of the rhythm of the song, which I can completely understand, but is it put together literally like note by note, or do you just like, just take off in your own direction after you hear the rhythm of the song and just like put it down in one take? Well, if you listen to uh, the solos in uh, Turn On The Fire, yeah. Uh, like, say, uh, I'm the one. That's double tracked. So I had to play that note for note twice. Not and easy. Then, no, not easy. But it's got that thick sound, you know, because it's not, it's not an echo machine. You're doing it twice as a guitar player. So some songs, uh, some solos are worked out, you know. But when you go live... Um, you're still kind of basically starting it the same way. You're ending it the same way, but somewhere in the middle, that's where all the, uh, the ad-libbing happens. And, and again, with, with, the, uh, with your rhythm section and dip, uh, on how, how they're feeling on that night. And that's hard to find people to play with that makes you feel like playing. I think uh, I was reading an interview with Jimi Hendrix one time, and he was saying that... Um, the people that he was playing with uh, it just makes you feel like playing. Like you want to play because you, you, they're there. Yeah, yeah. It's a com camaraderie, you know, and it, you know, having people that are going to yeah, push you it. and make you better. Yeah, that's it. You know, people, yeah, people that you play with, yes. 
Well, you had an amazing career with those guys, Bernie. And, you know, I could talk to you forever, but I got another guest I got to get on in 15 minutes, and I want to yes. play more music from your two records. But, Bernie, it was such an honor and a pleasure talking with you today. Such a big fan. And now that the COVID thing is over, at least till the government comes up with something else they want to, you know, put out there. Hopefully, you guys know, will maybe get right. back together and, and do more shows and maybe, maybe work on some new music while yeah. you're all still active and playing and healthy. There you go. Hey, Mike, you said the magic word. While still here and healthy, and thank God for that. Let's enjoy every moment that we're still here. Absolutely, it couldn't be better. But Bernie, yeah. it was a pleasure to talk to you today, my friend, and have a, a great night. We are, Mike. Okay, thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Bernie. Take care. Bye, bye, friend. Okay. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye. All right, let's get on some music from Psy. You know what? I I got to play Fox in the Rum because it's my favorite sweet tune. But let's do something else before that. <laughs>
one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time and one of my favorite, Sweet, covered by another great rock band, Psy, Fox on the Run. Okay, I want to thank Bernie for being on here tonight. He was a great guy to talk to, and I really had a good time with that. We're going to get to Frank Oresti from Demon Axe and Fate's Warning in about 15 minutes. We'll play a couple more songs. I tell you, having two guests on live each week is rough. <laughs> There's a lot of talking, and you try to keep both interviews fresh by not repeating the questions, you know, so it does get a little challenging over there. At least when I pre-record stuff, I know what was going on during that interview, so I try not to repeat it for the live guest, but, phew. All right, well, like we said, Heaven Hell Records, they re-released Demon Axe's first unreleased record, if that makes any sense, and their demo tape with some bonus tracks, and they did a great job on the packaging, like always. Jeremy always puts out a fine product. Uh, we'll talk to Frank in a little bit. How about we play a couple more tunes between now and then? Since we're talking about Canada, we're up in Canada, how about some excited other great three-piece band from the region? Rising of the Dead.
Celtic Frost with Circle of the Tyrants right before that. M80 with Frying Pan into the Fire. That group started out as a two-piece band in the mid... Well, actually the early 80s, around 82. It was a Nicky Buzz from Vendetta and Don Costa who had just got fired from Ozzy Osbourne's band. He was playing with the band around the Bark at the Moon era. Uh, if I remember, you know, Dom is famous for using a cheese grater on stage and grating his knuckles or his stomach with it, uh, you know, to draw blood. <laughs> he was a mental case, that guy, but, and to play with Ozzy, you gotta be a real mental case, too, especially back then in, in his drug fuel days, but they got into a fight on stage or something, or before they went on stage, I don't remember the whole story, but Sharon Osbourne had Don Costa invite his whole family to the next show, when the family was flown out and got there, Sharon fired him right before the show, so that's how the story goes, and you know, back then a lot of people didn't believe that Don was making up, and knowing what we know about Sharon today, I would say it's a pretty good chance that that was a real story. All right, let's get some Demon Axe on right now, and uh, while the song's playing, I will get Frank on the line, so here you go, play it loud.
All right, let's get Frank on the phone. Okay, maybe we're not going to get Frank on the phone. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. It says invalid number. Maybe I dialed the wrong number. I'll tell you what. Let me play another tune, and I will try to dial that number again. Bear with me. How about we do uh, Evil's Cast Aside? <laughs>
let's try this one more time. I don't know what's going on. It just keeps saying invalid number. Yeah, not having any luck here. So, you know, I hate the dollar on my personal phone because it doesn't sound so good. But then again, nothing on the show ever does. So maybe we'll try that. Hang on. Let me get, let me get him on my cell phone. I hate to do an interview this way, but... Nope. No luck. I do apologize. I think the record label sent over the wrong contact info. So, eh, what are we going to do? I'll reach out to him. I'll give him the show's number. I'll have him call into the show himself if he gets on before we wrap things up here tonight. Uh, but we'll just keep the music going between now and then. You know what? Let's get on to... We haven't really gotten to any metal news in quite some time. So, uh, you know, we'll do that. Godsmack, not a fan of the band or the music, but they just had to cancel the South American tour. They just released their newest record, the eighth one, and uh, Sully Erna from the band says, you know, they're done making new music. They're going to just live off the legacy of the past, and a lot of bands do that today. They realize there's a change in climate musically, and people want to hear the hits, but they had a South American tour book. You know, South America is like humongous for metal, and they couldn't sell enough tickets to fill up arenas. Meanwhile, you have... Neil Turbin going down there doing uh, the 40th anniversary of Fistful of Metal, which should be pretty cool. You have other bands going down there. You know, they're not even like real bands. They're like these uh, tribute bands that feature ex-members of bands. Right now, you have Left to Die out there touring. I think they're over in Europe right now. And then you have Death to All, who's touring the U.S. Two death bands, two death cover bands that feature ex-members of the band playing with them. And I looked at one of the videos from a show in Europe, and there's like, the place is packed. I mean, it's literally packed. I'm like... Who's going to... I mean, I'm, I'm convinced now that it has to be me. It can't be everybody else. It's got to be me. I don't see any interest in going to a club to see a death cover band that features the ex-bass player or the ex-keyboard player or the ex-drummer of a band. And most of the time, they're not even the original members of that band. They're people that joined the band three or four albums into the, the group's existence. But these shows are selling like crazy now. Is the people from my generation that came up through the 70s and 80s that were there with these bands in the beginning going to these shows and some sort of nostalgia trip that they just wanted to have some sort of relationship with the band that they knew or these old young kids that weren't around back then that just don't give a shit about the legacy of a band anymore I can't figure it out it's like every freaking band there's like multiple versions of the same bands all out there playing it it's just ridiculous in my opinion and I know I talk about this all the time, but I just feel like it's a horrific thing. And we talked, I think it was last week I mentioned violence. Sean Killian, Sean Killian is the only person left in violence. After getting back together with the majority of that classic lineup, little by little, members started falling by the wayside. Now, Phil Dremel sitting out another tour because he's busy with other bands that he's playing with. So violence really isn't his priority. Obviously, and he even came out and said that he didn't feel comfortable after a lot of the members started leaving the band after they got back together, and he felt like he was up there playing with a bunch of fillings. So I think Phil is probably done with violence, and probably Sean is going to keep it going with all these new members. But that's not really violence, even though he is the singer and the voice of the band. It was great when it got back together when Bobby joined up from you know ex overkill guitar player Bobby Gustafsson. So I was like, that's a great person to take over on the second guitar duty for the band. And he was out, and the next one was out, and the next one was out. Perry Strickland was out about a week or two ago. So this is what's going on in the music world today. And I guess you need to take it or leave it. I would rather leave it and not go to see a band live at all than to see some half-assed version of a band that I used to be in love with back in the 80s. Just me. Just my opinion. I don't know what to tell you. Ah, okay. Maybe we should get back to some music right now. <laughs> I was going to play some Fates Warner, but considering that we can't get Frank on the show, uh, maybe we'll skip that. Kenny Powell on line nine. <laughs> yeah, Chris Locke. That's right. <laughs> All right. You know what? Let's do some steel out of Germany. Strike back.
United with Sniper, and right before that, Kubla Khan with Liars Dice. That band features Greg Handovit, who played with Megadeth for a hot minute back in the day. So naturally, if you played with Megadeth for just, it only takes about a minute to be in that band, you get to play with the Kings of Trash, or the Kings of Thrash, as they're known. They've resurrected every ex-Megadeth member you could think of, no matter how long they were in the band for. I think the band is a complete and absolute joke. I've said it a million times before. They had a show here at the Chance in Poughkeepsie, New York the other day, and it was canceled due to the weather. Really, the weather wasn't that bad, but I guess we got to thank Mother Nature sometimes for something because we got the band canceled. So, good thing for that. They're just ridiculous. They keep digging up ex-members that have been there. I, I get it. It's the I hate Dave Mustaine Club. Dave Mustaine is definitely the biggest dick among dicks in the world. There's no doubt about it. But if you think he gives a shit that you guys are playing in a hundred cl- in clubs for a hundred people when he's out there playing in arenas and humongous stadiums, he doesn't give a shit. You're not bothering him. <laughs> Gotta be honest with you. It's just the stupidest thing and they embarrass themselves by going out there doing it. Especially Jeff Young. I actually think I got an interview coming up with him in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they're promoting some uh, DVD or CD that came out and there's going to be interviews with him and Dave Ellison. So uh, I don't know which one I'm going to wind up with but I'm going to have to say the same thing to the two of them. This is just ridiculous in my opinion, this whole band. Like I said, I've had Craig, uh, Greg on the show before. Greg's a lawyer, and Kubla Khan was a really good band, and he's a good guitar player. So, you know, they drag him up on there. Then they had, uh, who else? Uh, Chuck Beale, the old drummer, for a little while was up there with them playing. I mean, what are they going to do next? You know, resurrect Gar Samuelson and Nick Menza? I mean, are they going to dig them up next? I mean, they literally have to dig them up, and they probably will, and <laughs> put their bones on stage. It's just a joke, this whole band. All right, we're going to wrap it up here now. I apologize that Frank Arresti wasn't on tonight's show, but we had the great Bernie Carlos of Psy. I would have kept talking to him for a lot longer if I knew Frank wasn't going to be able to make it. Not that he wasn't able to make it. Something happened with the communication. I usually send out things in the beginning of the weekend, letting people know that I'm on the show. Here's your time, and I'll call you. But this was set up by the label, and I was going to call him. They sent me the number. They might have made a mistake and put the wrong digit down. I don't know. But I always send out the station number to people also in case they want to call in. You know, in the old days on the Block Talk Radio Show, almost every guest called into the show uh, using the show's switchboard number. I, when we started doing the show again here on Spreaker, I started calling the guests because, you know, I, I know I'm going to reach them and get to them where they forget and they don't call in and, and then we're missing a guest. So it, it just happened. But I'm sure we'll have Frank on. Probably won't be this month because we're really overloaded with guests the next couple of weeks, but maybe next week. All right, let's wrap it up here tonight with some Slaughterlidge, that killer band out of France. There's only like one or two songs of the record I could play because I really can't pronounce any of the words because most of them are in French. Where, this is when I need a French-Canadian. Where are those French-Canadians right now to help me out with the language barrier? But here's Encore Un Jour. If I pronounce it right, the Canadians are laughing at me so over the French, but that's the best I can do. I could barely speak English because I'm from Brooklyn, don't forget. All right, have a great week, everybody. Take care. Oh, wait, I forgot. Who do we have on the show next week? We do have guests on here next week. I just forgot who they are. All right, let me see. Oh, next week we have, uh, I think we have Steve Bash for next week from uh, Tynator? I'm not even sure. I got to be honest, I don't remember who else is on the show next week. I think Joe Cerner from uh, Black Virgin is on next week, so we got a great line of comment here. We'll see you guys then in the new sort of Lidge. This is actually the first time I'm playing it myself, so we're hearing it for the first time together. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday.